Nice. A Wookiee Jedi. Awesome. I had a fanfic about this. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. This is episode two of The Acolyte because I enjoy torturing myself. For you. For you. Not for, not not because of the show. No, not at all. But I did watch episode two. You know, episode one, episode two came out at the same time. If you haven't checked out my review, of course, there, there are spoilers of episode one. Go check it out, then come back here because, yeah, we're going to get into more spoilers over here on episode two. And, oh boy, was that a doozy. But, without further ado, let's get into it. Episode two starts off by infiltrating a Jedi temple. But apparently it's quite easy to do that. All you need is a street rat who will talk to a... a security robot, and then you just throw some device that'll activate and turn the robot into nothing and just open up the gate. I guess that's as easy as it takes. Oh, but guess what? You can walk past Jedi in the Jedi Temple without them questioning who you are. And funny enough, later on, you do know that they did reach out and say, hey, we saw a suspect who looked exactly like the person you're looking for. Hmm, very strange, isn't it? But I guess, you know, for plot points, you can just walk right into any Jedi temple. This guy is actually kind of interesting. You will learn more about him later, and I'll get to it when we reach that point. But let me tell you, it's crazy. Anyway, he's levitating there, meditating, you know, I thought, you know, what, actually kind of a pretty cool Jedi thing to do. Later on, I just, uh jeez. Like, but anyway, she shows up there, you know, and it's like she issues the same challenge. Ah, oh, we have unfinished business, Jedi. I'm here to fight. Now, defend yourself, whatever. I didn't even I just just the same thing she said in episode one. I just don't care for it. That's the problem. Now, he doesn't respond, he doesn't move, he just stays there. She tries attacking him, you know, with her fists and feet and everything kicks and just doesn't get through because i guess because he's meditating he's impenetrable or at least that is what they all think he is and she doesn't get through because of that barrier she even throws her uh, throwing knives at the guy but doesn't get through. Anyway, she takes off. So we have this guy walk in, look around. I guess he felt a disturbance in the force or something, but wasn't able to see the throwing knives that were on the floor. It's like, okay, whatever, and just basically walks out. Later on, you find out that he uh, did contact the Jedi Council or something to the effect, or the green thing, which I guess I looked up as female. Oof. Um, that being said, nothing happens. It's like, whatever. Like, he, I guess, just walks in, felt a disturbance, looks around as if something happened, but doesn't see the weapons on the floor. It's like, and I guess the other one was just like, oh, well, I'll just leave them there. Whatever. Oh, another bad CGI ship. What a surprise. Why does her room on this Jedi ship look exactly like the one she had when she was on the Tread Federation ship. I guess there's only one ship builder in the entire galaxy far, far away, huh? Try to make this make sense. If you're in a fight for your life, you do not pull your lightsaber to protect yourself. No, you don't do that. But once you have the person in custody, uh, then we're going to get rid of this person quickly and decisively. That does not sound like Jedi to me at all. Oh, by the way, I did find out that this green looking thing, Jedi, whatever she is, is actually a female. I looked it up on Wikipedia. By the way, did you also know she 
the screen person is the life partner of Leslie Headland, the former personal assistant of Harvey Weinstein. Hmm, I wonder how she got that job. Before I forget it, I should also mention that the Jedi now know that there is a twin and the mystery's out. Like, even the Jedi know now that there's a twin and that she's alive and walking around and doing shit. So, no big mystery there anymore. And for some reason, it's now okay for Orsha or whatever her name is to tag along and she could possibly be an asset well i'm like hold on the entire time you're talking about that there's there you know you're too connected you're too attached that's her freaking twin sister who she believed had been dead now you learn in this episode that she really hates her sister until she actually sees her. So we'll get into it. I know. Spoilers, spoilers. I'm sorry. Um, very strange. But now she's suddenly an asset when I'm like, no, take her into custody. Take her to Coruscant. By the way, if you have her on Coruscant, guess where the twin sister should be going sooner or later? Wouldn't she like and put the word out? Hey, we have your sister. We know where you are. Come on, like, put some thought into it, people. I'll be perfectly honest. When I first saw this character, I kind of believed I saw Ezra Miller there for a second. Yikes. So here, the main protagonist gets a potion, a poison mixed up because she doesn't know any other way how to defeat the Jedi in the temple. So there's that poison. Her weird droid thing is actually called a pip droid. Yes, I'm not joking. It's it's a pip boy in form of a droid. Trying to be Fallout here, huh? Matrix, Fallout. I wonder what else we'll get. So they do have a bit of a back and forth talking about their past, their future, you know, the possibility of her twin sister still being alive and that he tried to save both of them and the regrets that they both have. She first claiming that she must have been a bad student and him saying, no, he was a bad teacher. What a surprise, the guy is a bad teacher. Remember him? Oh, but look at the guy in the background. Jeez, Jedi really do let themselves go, don't they? So earlier I did promise that I would get back to this guy and what we learn about him. So apparently now Jedi can meditate and shut themselves off, never needing to talk, needing to move, needing to eat, needing to drink for 10 years. He's just meditating there and has his full strength and there's no problems whatsoever. Interesting. I didn't know that Jedi could do that. I learned something new, I guess. Feels very Star Wars-y. By the way, she basically tells him, you remember me? Yeah, now time for your sins, you know, blah, blah, blah. And by the way, you want to either, you know, wake up and tell the Jedi Council yourself that you did it, or you could just ask me for forgiveness and take this uh, poison. Guess what he does? Yep, you guessed it. He wakes up after 10 years, takes the potion, and dies. Yeah, she's the one who finds him on the floor and then picks up the vial where the poison was in. Oh, but luckily, a guy who wants to get rid of her and force choke people to get what he wants, he's the one who saves her. And like, no, nope, it wasn't her. I had my eyes on her the entire time. Did you know that in the Star Wars universe, citizens aren't allowed to have weapons? Isn't that a Democrat dream? Oh, by the way, I guess in this entire city, there is only one apothecary and he's right next to the Jedi Temple. And I guess they stake it out to make sure that, you know, wonder who that guy is and stuff like that. Uh, the... 
young Jedi Knight, he comes up with an idea of just, you know, going there, talking to the guy, and then arresting his ass. While the Padawan, the young one, was like, why don't we send her in, get him to talk, then we have proof, you know, because, you know, the Padawan female, whatever she is, is a lot smarter than anyone else around. Anyway, they then do that because I guess there's only one apothecary in the entire city again. Makes no sense. So she goes in undercover and I guess she buys this scarf thing to, I don't know why, but uh, the thing you can see here clearly in the next scene, you actually see that that scarf is big enough to cover her whole body. It's like they had two different scarves. See, told you. So they clumsily have a talk where he realizes that she is the twin and she lives. But then the other Jedi come in, you know, surround him like, hey, you're not getting away from here. And um, he is scared that they will erase his memory. Now, look, I do know that playing the Kotar games, you do learn that there is this ability to remove someone's memories and to basically reset their life. Now, this doesn't seem to happen often in Star Wars. And it just, in this instant, I just felt MIB is back. That's all that I felt. Just a side note, it is kind of weird that the twins here have the same exact hairstyle, even though that they have not been around each other ever since they were children. So for some reason, the evil twin decides to return to the shop where she is confronted by Asian master. And he tries to, you know, let her know that your sister is still alive. And uh, I tried to save you both. And uh, why are you doing this? Like turn back to the, to the, bright side and who's your enemy uh, uh, who's who trained you right <laughs> ah great more bad DJI fighting why does nobody pull their lightsaber out to defend themselves this makes You're no sense without them. So I guess, you know, because nobody in Star Wars can, you know, use weapons for some reason to defend themselves or to fight or at all, you know, they go back and forth with hands and feet and everything and just the force. And it's like, oh, my God, this scene right here, like I, I had to pause it right here and be like, oh, my God, this looks like it's some kind of really, really bad magician from real life. You know, the levitating trick. And it's so freaking obvious. Oh, my Lord. And I do have to point out they are fighting right outside this apothecary, which is right next to the Jedi Temple. I guess this entire city only has this one little street in it or something because that's the size, that's the magnitude of this city. Oh yeah, here's the scene where the good twin meets the evil twin for the first time and, you know, instead of stunning her and trying to help her, she, uh, I mean, she deliberately shoots off target. It's like, right, sure, you tried your best there, miss. But no, let's let her leave. Let's, you know, she can go and then maybe you can kill another Jedi. So this green Jedi master apparently is high enough on the totem pole that she can call in for the council to meet. And the council decides, you know what? You all are coming back to Coruscant. We all know that you know where she's headed, but uh, no, come back and, you know, we have to gather again because you're too close to this. Oh, but wait, you sent the sister along because she could be an asset. Now, come come back so that another Jedi can die. Uh, wow. What a surprise. It is actually kind of refreshing to see a Wookiee Jedi and yeah, I'm not kidding when I'm saying that in seventh grade, I wrote a fanfic with a Jedi master, well, grandmaster in my story, 
that was a Wookiee. I actually enjoyed that character, so it was kind of cool to see this character as a tease, even at the end of the episode. So I have to be perfectly honest. I don't know what this show is trying to be. Is it trying to be Star Wars? I don't get the feeling of that. Is it trying to be Matrix like it was in episode one? Is it trying to be Fallout with the Pip-Boy? Is it trying to be the Men in Black? I don't know. What is it? Could it be, you know, mystery? Which there's not big a big mystery around it anymore since you know that there's an evil twin out there. I mean, I guess it's still a mystery what the Jedi did to piss her off because we still don't know that. Uh, I mean, I guess it could be a crime show. I mean, I guess that's what it's turning out to be because she's committing so many crimes and just, I mean, if it's even a crime for a citizen to uh, hold the gun in this Star Wars universe, you know what it is? It is subversion. That's what the show is. That's what the show has become. Subversion on all fronts. And I don't understand it. It's like, on one hand, they're trying to portray the, the Jedi as evil as this time is not, you know, not good because the uh, evil twin is going to be turning out to be the good twin, you know, because she's actually good. Because she has a righteous reason for all that she's doing. Overall, this episode was probably just as shitty as the first episode. Maybe even a little bit more, to be perfectly honest. Now, I did say that at the end, I did enjoy seeing the Wookiee. That, I mean, I guess it's a little caveat. I mean, I keep saying, you like, you know, even you know, like when you watch these shows, Disney Plus, Star Wars shows and stuff like that, you're digging through shit. You're digging through big, heaping, stinking, hot piles of shit just to find that one piece of chocolate in it. I guess that's the one piece of chocolate in this episode is the Wookiee. But you know what I did miss in this episode? You guessed it. You truly guessed it. That's her. Tassie Loa. I kind of missed her in this episode. I don't know why she isn't in it. She was the most interesting character. The only one that I actually cared about learning more about. Yes, I know. Please don't judge me. I know it's a cat girl thing. I'm going to be watching Reincarnated as a Sword because, you know, cat girls. But hey, that is episode two of The Acolyte for you. I did not enjoy that, except for doing this for you. So I do hope that you enjoyed it. I hope that you enjoyed this video. If you did, let me know down in the comments below what you thought of this episode or what you think of my review and the new style I'm trying to go for. Also, please smash the like button. It definitely helps. Or you know what? If you didn't like what I have to say, downvote this video. It still helps me and it helps you. I guess, maybe. It do, it'll do something. Anyway, thank you for stopping by, and until next time, take care.